hour, I want to say, you're going to get to kind of listen into a conversation that these six panelists are going to have um, about what we do at school and what we do in life. So that is the general program. And then at the end, there will we'll open it up to conversations. Um, so I hope that you enjoy that. Um, and I'm like, fuck, man, you must get a hint. And um, we just ask that you keep muted for the first 30 minutes. That's okay. All right. So let's start. Um, Dr. Montessori, if she were alive today, would be around 150 years old. Um, but her philosophy, her pedagogy, her method that we follow in our schools at DVMS Strata Insight um, actually began a millennia before her birth. It began with human humans and humans being born and humans living in community. So this idea, this concept that we have that is Montessori education is actually a natural human development. So humans thousands of years ago were born into a community of people and grew holistically through time together in community. And what Dr. Montessori did is she noticed this natural pattern of development. She was a scientist, she was an observer, and she observed that children develop universally in the same method. They begin at birth in their learning and that learning continues through a lifetime. And so her method really supports this, um, this growth of their, of their mind, their body and spirit that she observed um, that they, they did, whether we involved ourselves or not um, in their education. So when we look at um, the idea of what we're going to talk about tonight, which is the child through their development, through their age and time, um, we're going to look at all these very specific stages that Dr. Montessori noticed that, um, that the child went through as they grew. Uh, she noticed specific times in their lives and you'll see that we divide those times in our schools. Um, so from zero to six, this is a, a time that, that is very specific and uh, we call it the first plane. Six to 12 is the second plane. 12 to 18 is the third plane. And the last plane is um, 18 to 24. And, and she noticed once they were 24, they were an adult. They had kind of grown into this fully integrated human. Um, and, and um, what is interesting about our philosophy is that it follows, follows each child in their unlimited potential and, it, and it, we, we walk with them on their journey as they construct themselves. Um, we, have divide, we have brought this panel together tonight and we are dividing this panel into our six amazing guides. We have guides here tonight at each level to talk about some characteristics of our education model. Uh, I thought it would be really fun to do this tonight because re-enrollment's coming up. And so it's gonna be like a little sideways um, uh, sales pitch to you because we are so uh, in love with what we do every day that um, we hope that you will come and join this journey through, through your child's growth from birth until 18. And so you're gonna hear um, your child how your child grows at every stage of development. And so um, we separated this panel by age uh, to follow those, those four planes. And, um, and so I'm going to throw it over to our panelists to introduce themselves and talk about what they love about your children and, and why they are here tonight. So we're gonna start with Ali, who's in YCC and I don't know where she is, but she's gonna unmute and go ahead, Ali. Hi. Um... I'm Allie, uh, I'm in YCC North. So I'm with our, our tiniest, some may say cutest. Um, they are often walking around in their underwear, which is pretty neat. Um, so I, yeah, as I said, I'm with the youngest ones. Uh, Kate, is this where we want a story too? Yeah, okay. So one thing that I love about our classroom is we never know what is going to come out of some of their mouths and it's amazing at times and other times they call you out on stuff that you don't want to be called out on they're very honest um so this week we were baking and Elana has been putting some new ingredients so he had um coconut cranberry 
uh, in our muffins. And one of our older ones, he's getting ready to transition. He was telling me how coconut and cranberries are, are so sweet. Don't, doesn't it smell so good? Do you want to smell it, Allie? I'm like, sure, let me smell it. And then he goes, you know what's not sweet? Coffee. It's really bitter. You like coffee. Do you like bitter things? And I just went like, yeah, I guess I do. And that was when I knew I'm like, it's your time to go is that, you know, what's sweet, you know, what bitter is <laughs> you have outgrown us here and it's time to go. So it's so nice to have those conversations with them and their honesty and whatnot. So that's what I, one thing that I love most about being in my, in my level. Sally Delta. Hi everybody. My name is Delta. I'm one of the Casa guys. Um, I mean, uh, Casa East. Um, well, you know, there are thousands of stories that we can choose from. And, um, you know, most of the time we're just so um, amazed at their empathy. And so this um, past week, uh, there was a, one of the three-year-olds, she was doing wood polish and um, she was sitting there and, you know, she had a really long um, statue polishing and she had it sideways and she was like working at it and she was like polishing and make it super, she was super concentrated and, you know, she was uh, working really hard and it was almost the end of um, the morning and, you know, we were coincidentally watching her, um, you know, looking at her and then one of the third, one of the older children, the five-year-olds, you know, just passes by and didn't stop, but just glanced and, and said, wow, that is shiny. And, you know, kept looking. And also then, you know, she came out kind of like a, out of her concentration and she, she looked up and she's like, oh, like she, you kind of, you know, see these thought process and like, oh, he was talking about my object and she looked and then, you know, like the face of joy of, you know, proud. She, she was so proud of her work and so overjoyed of, you know, that comment that, you know, it was slowly the smile can, came over her face and it was like, yes, those moments are like what we live for. So um, we have thousands of those moments every day. So we're super lucky. Thanks Delta, Jody. Hi everyone, I'm Jody, and I am one of the lower elementary guides in DVMS. I am in Lower North and my story, and you're right Delta, it is hard to choose. Um, right now we have class representatives in both lower elementary classrooms and those students in our classrooms are given opportunities to help out in the classroom at and to do different jobs for us or do some inventory and things like that. And one of the, the things that we have implemented this year um, is having our class representatives do a class meeting every week. And what they do is we go through questions and we talk about things that went well in the classroom and things that didn't go so well, um, some moments of or some acts of kindness that they witnessed and also any upcoming events and the class reps will ask the students in the classroom and they will take notes and then eventually email out to parents um, what what they've kind of observed over the month and it's so neat because it always ends up showing such a wide variety of of things that we don't even get to witness in the classroom because we're we're busy we do see a lot of things but so many other things go so unseen and when you hear from the students in the classroom talking about how um you know so and so helped them with their racks and tubes or they were feeling lonely at recess and another person came and helped them out and played with them all of those little moments um it really just kind of warms your heart and touches you and, and gives you that good sense that um, what you're doing and, and helping to build that empathy within the classroom. Uh, they also talk about the things, the things that didn't go so well, but even those are brought with like this idea of how are we gonna solve this problem? And it's so neat to hear them kind of solving those problems on their own and working through some of the, the social injustices that they face at this age and, and still and still manage to um, have great ideas and great solutions to those problems. Thanks, Jody. 
Joanna. Hi, everyone. I'm in Upper uh, Elementary West these days with Shaylin, and uh, we have the nine to 12 year olds there. So my story, it's like the story that never ends and never began, but it's, I'm gonna show you a little um, snapshot of something that's been evolving over a few weeks. So it's just monitoring some play at recess, which is always really, really interesting at this age. A um, few weeks ago when we returned from our online learning, uh, there was a big adjustment of being back in person and kind of like the, the neurons all firing about, oh yeah, this is how we communicate and this is how we are um, as people together, um, especially playing. And uh, one group had done some rough play that then had emerged into something really highly constructed with a lot of rules where you had to tap somebody five times on the knee or something and then you'd be out and there was lots of arguing. <laughs> And then this, this kind of evolved and we didn't, the, the teachers, we didn't know where it would go um, on week three of being, of being, actually week two of being together and uh, just, just watching how it emerged. So here we go. Here's, here's the scenario of how we evolved this week. There's a language lesson happening. We're writing, um, we're writing with word choice in mind, which is great for this age because they've explored things like figurative language and synonyms and homonyms and antonyms are all in their repertoire from their lower L experience. And we're talking about an acronym and how to infuse our writing with million dollar words. And our little assignment in our group was to write a, a really boring sentence and then rewrite it using some of these really awesome words. And, and one guy came to me and showed me a really sad you know, a uh, sentence that was pretty bland and it was about how recess was really boring. And then his second sentence was still <laughs> that, only just slightly different. So really wasn't doing much with our assignment, but was really trying to communicate to me um, that there's a problem. So I had heard too that there was some moping uh, the previous day at recess. So, so I started talking and he started talking and of course others are listening in and always ready to participate in anything, any problem is gonna be group solved, right? <laughs> no one can stay away from these moments. And uh, the thought was just, well, okay, recess is boring because we don't have our forts anymore. We don't have the hockey area. Well, what do we need? And someone said, oh, a slide. We thought, well, no, we can't have a slide. That's not gonna work. And what, well, can you just bring something into your space that would make it fun? And all of a sudden the light bulb moment was, yeah, we can ask Colin for some balls. <laughs> so it's like, eureka moment. But this, is, this just um, evolved into what then became days of a massive dodgeball game with seven or eight balls at a time and a log in between and all these uh, players playing. And the, the very best of, the sportsmanship and the difficulties with with group play right but it's it's how they're going to learn socially so there were times where younger students were getting out and kind of like uh, this is you know I don't want to be out that wasn't fair and some a bigger guy is saying don't worry I'll get you back in in a second just sit down like this kind of thing so they're learning to deal with it um so then we are positioned in where there's a little willow grove and the other class of upper L's are beside us in another territory and they see us uh, and they start coming out of where they've been building forts and they get closer and closer. And suddenly somebody says, oh, let's drag the log over. And they did a big two class dodgeball game, <laughs> just <laughs> throwing it back and forth. It was really, uh, really a lot of fun for a lot of kids, girls getting involved and, and some, some people that normally wouldn't be playing that type of game. Okay, but student A, not happy anymore about this. So this is this is me trying to show you what this age group is like. Is that um, for for this person, the the goal was to construct something that everyone would play, and now it had changed. So this is also what we work with with this age. Is that sometimes the expectations and transitions can happen fast and furious because it's so socially motivated that it can leave others behind and they need a little chance to catch up. And that sometimes our connection as guides or as parents is to put it into place for the student and say, yeah, it is different than what you intended and you had a great run at it, but now look at that. Like there are positives to what you're seeing here. It isn't your game anymore, that's true. But can you step back for a second and look? So, um, so we're, we're gonna see what happens tomorrow because <laughs> who knows, right? Who knows what it will become? That's the story. Thanks, Joanna. Justin? 
Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm here proudly representing Strata, which is kind of the, the middle school of, of our family, or sorry, the middle child of, of our family of schools. Um, and every day there, there are new stories here, just it's hard to choose. But I did want to share one, which was from our, our recent health unit that we were just starting, sexual education, which, which we all have remember being scarred from in, a, in our middle age years. But it's something that's a lot of fun up here. It's a it's a really safe environment to to really have fun with with this topic. And um, the guides and I usually do some of our planning in some of the common rooms. And I, I brought down a whole bunch of sex ed books when we first came back to to school. And um, I left them in there. <laughs> For, didn't bring them back up into the office, but it's all good. We came back we came back down a little bit later in the day to find one of our one of our classes completely engulfed in all of these sexual education books that, that, that we had that we had left out. And it was really, really cool. It, not, they weren't flipping through there as, as I would have maybe pointing out pictures, pointing out terms, stuff like that. They were having meaningful conversation around, around the topics in, in these books. And it was really cool because we got to kind of come in and start having conversations with our students. What, what does interest you? Like, what are, you, what are your questions? Let's, let's talk about this. And I think there was a really great... It's, a, it's, it's an epitome, I think, of, of our program, following the child, seeing what their interests are, being creating a safe environment that they're able to ask these really uncomfortable questions with, with their teachers, um, which is something I never grew up with. So it's, it's, it's really great to be, to be a part of it. And, it, and though that safe environment really creates you know, this rich content that, that we're coming up with in our, in our health unit. Uh, it, it, it makes it a lot more engaging when it's coming from them. And we get to experience stuff like that every day. But that's one story I wanted to share with everyone. Thanks, Justin. Eric? Hey, good evening, everyone. Um, Justin, we don't have as much fun with sex at the site level for obvious reasons. And I just want to say that outright. Um, but we are dealing with the, the upward part of the third plane, which kind of doesn't mean anything unless you're a Montessorian. But it means everything to the extent that very few schools have gone this far. We all know Montessori is very popular at the early level. And there's literally a dozen schools that have gone as far as the high school level in North America. So it is a very unique and challenging thing to continue that programming. The three words I would use to describe this level are the words I've used even before I was a Montessori teacher, which is... Children at this level become adolescents. So let's just call them adolescents instead of teens because teens is, is boring and more like YA literature and I don't like any of that stuff. The three words are embrace the gray. Basically the, the brain has gone from a concrete operational, what's known as a rule role mind um, in, in sort of age 12 where everything is exact and has to be exact. And this is the way the game is played and all these things are the flexibility starts to kind of cave in a little bit, which is an important part of that development. And then when they're 16, 17, 18, there's that one wonderful window again, that's kind of familiar to those parents who recognize that in their six to 10 year old, where you, you can actually stop thinking in black and white terms. And this really gets parents upset because parents can very, can very much be black and white. And that's why teens and parents fight and adolescents and parents fight because the adolescent is also striving for that identity separate from the parents. And this is where it gets difficult because as this child is now embracing the gray, they're embracing perspectives they've never embraced before. They're embracing questions instead of answers. And it sort of opens itself up again, just at the same time where parents want to make sure that the child goes to university and has the marks and doesn't come back to the home and cost me a fortune for the next 10 years. And unfortunately, you have to trust the process and you have to trust the development. They are gonna make mistakes. And so we are really in the business of failure at this level in the business of mistakes. And that's kind of the valorization and that's a word that may be used again tonight. And it's a word that really comes to play in this adolescent part 
of development because, well, I'm, I'm just going to let you sit there with, I'm not going to define the term right now, but valorization is such a huge part of being part of Montessori and the way that we guide the adolescents at this level is something that I would like to call radical empathy because we have to empathize with these mistakes. These mistakes in duality, these mistakes in sexual preferences uh, or changing back and forth, not mistakes so much as just trying all of this stuff out. And we have to have radical empathy towards that because it's literally the last time in their lives before things really harden up. Um, so we don't want to make them grow up too fast, but they also want to grow up fast. And so that tension is part of what we do at site. Thanks, Eric. Okay. So those are our panelists for tonight. Uh, from, from the stories that you heard, you can hear that, that the philosophy we follow is something we call a help to life. It's a holistic view from, from birth all the way through adulthood. And what uh, Dr. Montessori said was, and this is a quote, the growth of the child from birth to maturity is not like that of an oak tree, which grows simply by getting bigger, but rather is to be compared with that of a butterfly. For we have to do it with different types of minds at different periods. These periods indeed differ so greatly from one another that some people compared the development of the human being to a succession of new births. And so tonight we will dive into these different people and we will start with one very simple question. And I invite everyone on the call tonight to get a piece of paper or a uh, phone that you can write something down. Uh, our first question of the evening for everyone to answer themselves and then the panelists will share their answer is, who is this child individual in six words? So parents at home, write down six words to describe your child. And if you have one more than one child, feel free to write six words for each child. And our panelists are going to write six words that describe the child at the level they work. We'll just give a pause for a few seconds for you to think. Determined. Um, <laughs> and Allie, when you're ready, you can start us off. So I'll start. So just a reminder, I work with kids who are starting at 16 months to about three, but I'm going to be talking about kids from birth to three years tonight. But six words that come to mind that I see every day in our class is egocentric, irrational, strong-willed, curious, capable, underestimated, and I'm throwing a seventh one in, um, amazing. <laughs> so those are words that come to mind. Well, yeah, okay. So at the castle level, and again, six words, it's, <laughs> I changed it 30 times. So my final answer <laughs> is uh, joyful, purposeful, love of order, love of work, beginning of socialization or community and absorbs knowledge effortlessly. Those are my seven words. Okay, and at the lower elementary level, so children six to nine, I picked um, that they're hero worshipers. They have a reasoning mind. They ask lots of why questions. Um, they are full of imagination. They love big work. Uh, it's also, they can be rude <laughs> um, and physically and mentally, uh, there's growth in both of those areas, strong. Thanks, Jody. Only three years separate us, so a lot of similarities with Upper L. Um, so I've looked at intellectual, uh, funny, almost everything's funny, expressive, even when not speaking, uh, emotional, flummoxed when things are new, uh, and last 
lastly, imaginative. You know, it's funny, Ali, I also had capable, curious, and creative. And it was funny because there are so many similarities in, in terms of like brain development with, with toddlers and, and adolescents. So it's funny that we both had capable, curious, and creative the social newborn. on our list. Social newborn. Speaking of social, I also had socialite. Adolescents are underestimated and they are also impulsive. All right. Thank you, Justin. And the top end, I've turned it into a sentence. It could be a provocation. It's definitely from the point of view of an adolescent. You don't get me at all. That's my six words. Thanks, Eric. All right. Now we're moving into the meat of the evening. We've come up with about six questions that we're going that kind of highlight the universality of our, our method. And each panelist is going to lead us in that conversation. And hopefully you'll have a chance to um, hear a little bit from each of them. And the first question is, how does this individual learn and what motivates them? Okay, uh, that is me. Um, I would say I'm actually going to start by talking about what motivates um, the children at age six to nine. They are huge social creatures. Delta Melt mentioned um, that the Kazas are becoming those social, uh, very strong connections are building with social, um, with their peers. And in lower, in lower elementary, that becomes their motivation. So quite often, if you hook one of them in the classroom, what often happens is that it kind of trickles through. And once one of them is interested in one thing, then you start to see some of their best friends become really interested in it as well. And we were uh, brainstorming as a lower community the other day and Nolene and Emma were sharing one of their students um, actually ended up doing a project on Croatia because uh, that's where his mom is from. And one of his best friends uh, ended up doing a project on Germany because that's where his family was from. So there's that drive as soon as they see one person do something, one of their friends do something, they're like, oh, I, I want to do that too. Um, in our classroom, we have like story writing going on like crazy and it's one person wants to do a story and then they're creating chapter books, but they always work on it in pairs. It's never something that they do um, alone at all. Um, and the great thing is, is that so many of the materials in the classroom are designed to encourage that pair work. So um, a lot of the stuff that's going on in our classroom right now in Lower North is they, uh, I mentioned that they love to do big work and it's, uh, there's actually two boys in our classroom right now that are taking out these huge, huge graph papers and they're doing double digit uh, division with uh, like a divisor of 24 and into off the page and they're taping pages together and it's all about um, doing that work together and then also making it huge at the same time. Um, and the learning comes in a whole bunch of different ways. So one of the biggest things in our classroom is that mentoring happens with the third years. Um, and they mentor the first years and the second years. And within, in the first year in their lower elementary, um, it's still very concrete, but towards the end of um, their third year, we start to move toward the abstraction a little bit more. Uh, we start with the really big picture and then we kind of hone in and move towards um, a smaller portion of it. So I'll give the example of our geography. We always start with um, the great lesson and we talk about how the universe was formed. And then we move into talking about planets and then all the way just down to the earth, the layers of the earth, um, 
construction of the earth, rocks and minerals, uh, that kind of thing. Um, we also take a spiral approach to our um, learning in lower elementary. So quite often they will receive the same lesson a few times and each time they receive it, we just give them a little bit more. And those lessons are kind of meant to give them inspiration and so that they take off and then they um, find their own interests from those lessons. Um, and it also allows for repetition and consolidation of each of those uh, lessons as well. I think I answered both of those questions. Good night, Roller. Who would like to jump in on that? One of our panelists. Sure. Um, I'll go for CASA three to six. So as we, as I mentioned in one of the six words, um, the children have a mind that absorbs um, knowledge eff without effort. So the advantage that we have in the CASA is like, we, we have a three-year age group at least. And so the children, you know, are exposed all the time, all, all day long, you know, the three-year-olds to the four-year-olds work and the five-year-olds. And, and so they're always, you know, they're observe, they're observing all the time and, and just taking it all in. And, you know, the, yeah, this three-year-old observing the five-year-olds or the, so the four-year-olds doing, you know, addition with thousands, hundreds, tens and units. And um, usually by the time we, you know, they get to experience that work, they go, they, they usually say, well, I know this work, I've seen it many times. I already want, you know, they, they, they get inspired by what is, you know, what is about to come because they can see the vast, the vastness of the work. And they, they just, you know, take all the work in and, um, you know, at the beginning, they just, basically following their their internal needs to you know develop concentration but they are at the same time they're you know the the work of this the three-year age group is you know is one of the most important parts of the casa environment i'll uh jump in on what delta had to say about the um absorbent mind or easily to absorb things so that's something that Montessori talks about a lot in the first six years and in the first three years um, Kate always loves to talk about this word the horme of the children in the first three years it's that guiding the inner guide for them on what interests them and what drives them to learn and once they feel that in the first three years, they have to do it. So we see that a lot in our room. You see that spark in them that's really pushing them to learn or wanting to do something. So we just follow that. So for example, on, uh, I keep thinking it was Friday because we had a snow day yesterday. Um, we, there was one of the children in my class just kept lifting up tables like people are working at the tables he's lifting them up and trying to walk around with them so i'm like okay you clearly need some bigger movement so we go outside and we have this bin of clipboards that isn't too heavy but for a 18 month old it's pretty heavy and so i get them to bring in the clipboard and it looks like he's carrying a 50 pound weight probably but he's like waddling in and this big movement, you can see the smile on his face. This is all he wants. Takes it into the other classroom, puts it down and literally like claps for himself and kind of like did this thing. And I was like, all right, you ready to go back? And he was like, yep. And we went back to our room and then that was kind of it. That need to do those things. I just gave him something purposeful on how he can learn and do those things. And once he fulfilled that need, that's all he needed. I was there. I was the guy he brought that giant uh, bin to. So I can uh, uh, say, I can attest that this was a, a, a reality. But he, he did, it looked like one of us carrying, just to give an a example, it was like one of us carrying a big tire. Like it was that heavy. Like he was red in the face and he was putting it against himself. And yeah, he did clap. And he kind of went like, okay, I did it. It's all done now. Job well done. <laughs> 
So just to reiterate the question, we're talking about how does the individual learn and what motivates them? I think Eric, I think you are ready to go. Yeah, I was, again, I wanted to amplify what, what Jody started. Um, there's so many things that make Montessori special. Uh, Tony just recently sent me something that had like the nine essential elements of a Montessori in some places it says five and some places it says eight, but you know, let's just keep, keep going up because there's so many great things. But if I had to put my money on one thing that I believe makes the difference, even at my level, it's the three year cycle. And you wouldn't think it would be, but at site school, we've done our absolute best to try and teach as many of our subjects, as many of our lessons with, with all the kids there. And so that also means very similar to what Jody was saying that the, the students, and because we've been now going for three years, the students are getting a similar lesson. Like I, I'll do the political spectrum every year. And the first year I taught it, well, the second year, the students were able to teach it. And by the third year, the students were able to teach it with awesome activities that made it engaging instead of just boring old me. So now you've got this lesson that's being carried literally not as heavy as a tire but literally being carried from one uh year level to another and it is so much different the learning environment than i've seen in any high school just because of that i've often said just as final thing to the, anyone that comes into site school if they're giving like a, a presentation or they're just there for one afternoon who who here is grade 10 who's grade 11 grade 12 and they don't know and the beauty, the beauty of that is the kids don't care after a while. And so all of that sort of fades away. And what becomes interesting is the learning. And then when people go, oh, we learned that last year, the excitement, even in a 17 year old, oh, we learned that last year. And I'm sure it's the same all the way up. And that's the three year cycle. So I put my money on that. Thanks, Eric. Um, Justin, shall we move on to the, the third question? What contributions does the individual at this age make to their community and society at large? Oh, that'd be great. <clears throat> Thanks, Keith. So at the adolescent level, they're beginning to ask themselves, where do I fit in? In fact, they, they ask themselves that on a daily basis. And how do I contribute to my, to my community and to society as, as a whole? And our program here at Strata is designed to be flexible, to follow those students' interests and to respond to those uh, and to respond to this developmental sensitivity of, of belonging and, and contributing. And some practical ways that, that we meet this characteristic are through um, weekly community work. So every Friday, we have a big chunk of time de dedicated to putting the needs of our community um, ahead of our own individual needs, so such as caring for chickens, harvesting and weeding, and tending to our permaculture gardens, chopping firewood for, for maple syrup production. Uh, cleaning and organizing their academic environments as well. And there are also opportunities to support our wider community outside of Strata, community cleanups and organized food drives. Um, a third of all the, the students' earnings from all of their cafes and all of their markets goes towards um, a charity of their choice every year. There's opportunities for meaningful social justice um, initiatives. So from raising awareness of, of First Nations relations, working with the Shani Renshack Gord Downey Foundation has been um, a wonderful part of our program. Um, and the, the students have organized um, protests, they've organized walks, they've, they've written letters to, to MPs to raise awareness about First Nations relations in our community. We've, we've been to climate change protests and our adolescents are given a real opportunity and real guidance to make real change. Um, and we have weekly council meetings too. Every, every Friday we come together as a community um, and this gives our ad adolescents uh, the social tools that they need to interact with, with grace and courtesy, to be able to speak up, to be able to, to listen to, to ideas and concerns and we solve challenges uh, together as another aspect of, of community. So through these practical applications that we provide for social and moral development, students become, they become empowered. They feel like they have a, a voice. They begin to understand that that, the, that voice is legitimate and then they're, they're capable and determined to create change if they're just given the chance, given. Thanks, Justin. 
Thanks, Justin. I think Joanna, maybe you could speak to this as well. Thanks. It's so it's so nice how Upper L and the adolescent they dovetail in together. So when when Justin's speaking about even the the Friday um, sort of meetings, that's something that really does get started in, in Upper L as well, where unlike in Lower L, you, you now have the students wanting to run these, they wanna run any, everything. So any parents here who are, who are in Upper L, you, you've heard, I'm sure of um, wanting to do um, teen bake sales, but also pizza days and watching a movie at school where you're pajamas. These are all things that are coming from students. It's always about working together, collecting money, not at not at, not to buy anything for themselves except for having having an opportunity to celebrate something together um but also looking at at causes outside of the school so they have these ideas of of collecting and and i i would say jody can speak to this but i would say the upper l's ideas about where funds should go are a little bit different than than the interests um of the lower l child um, but yeah, the, the meetings are largely run by the student. We, we step in if we need to um, just give an example of how to handle certain situations with a, with a large group of 24 children who are, who are taking turns speaking and, um, and then sometimes debating because we'll have lots of different opinions about how to solve some problems within the class. So, um, but yeah, the, I would say the community uh, is still, it's about in Upper L organizing things within the school, but with this idea that it will it will reach out or or allow them to reach out or get out of their classroom. So there's there's often that impulse of like, oh, we can do that over there, or we can do that over in, in this room. And they, there's there's oftentimes this impulse to to go. I half expect that they'll start to think of things that are even further off uh, of our campus, although it hasn't come up yet. So we'll we'll see where they go. Once that starts, it'll <laughs> they'll, they'll all remember because of the three year cycle, right? Jody, would you like to tell us about how yeah, I, I, evolves? Yeah, I agree with you a hundred percent, although it does shift for sure. Um, lower L bake sales always involve animals like money raised for animals, let's save the animals. <laughs> Always about animals. Um, yeah, so, so that is definitely a huge, a huge drive in, in the lower community is just um, that love of nature. They're so inspired and in all of the work that we do in zoology and learning about animals, I think maybe kind of shines through in those bake sale moments. Um, quite often before we couldn't, we used to go to visit Blackadar, which is just the senior resident up the hill. And that was also a great opportunity for them to kind of give back to the community. We used to go and do uh, show and tell. And it was um, always one of those heartwarming moments. Joe and I would always, Joanne and I would always talk about uh, those moments of them singing songs or doing show and tell and then quite often at the end they would go around and just visit each one of the senior residents and, and that was just um, it's such a heartwarming moment of seeing these children that were a little bit maybe hesitant in the beginning but but really kind of go out of their shell and go over and meet these people and and carry on a conversation with them and um, that's that's really sweet. But yeah, we've done lots of different things, potluck lunches, kind of similar to what Joanne is talking about with organizing things to um, get out of the classroom and that kind of thing. Bake sales are huge. Um, we did potluck lunch for the Hamilton Community Food Center, which is always really nice. And then, um, you know, any kind of little going out trips where they get to see anything local like the DBSA or the museum here in, in Dundas. It's always kind of a nice way for them to uh, put everything that they learned within the classroom into practice. <laughs> um, I think sometimes we forget about our youngest students as well and how they are contributors. Um, you know, they, they grew out of these elementary children and adolescent children grew out of these 
super tiny is making these contributions as well. So uh, Ali or Delta, would one of you speak to these the important contributions of our smallest? Sure. Um, well, we uh, obviously we we started with the care of indoor environment and outdoor environment. Um, we start the children will you know beautify the environment, arrange flowers, uh, care of the plants, make sure they're not over water or they don't die washing clothes and make sure that there are enough clothes for polishing and if the clothes run out um, you know someone will run and wash the clothes so someone else can have um, you know uh, clean clothes to do or iron the, ironing them when they're dry or uh, baking so we can have snack or washing the dishes after lunch cleaning after lunch all the cleanup is done by the children, emptying the recycling, uh, the compost, um, setting the tables for lunch ta um, with tablecloths, making sure everyone has, um, you know, the cutlery and the dishes and uh, something to drink and the jugs and, um, um, you know, for the outdoor environment as well, um, you know, taking care of the outdoor environment. That's also part, not, you know, shoveling when there's snow, but, you know, other things when there's spring planting and, you know, things like that. Um, so they also make contributions, I think, by, you know, the, the, the five-year-olds that are, you know, they, they are trying to consolidate their experience and their work. They often, you know, every day, basically, they, they ask to, well, they don't ask, they just go and they read to a three-year-old or they sit with them and do sound games or they show them how to make a chord or they, they guide them to do something. Um, and this, you know, that, that, is a, that is their own contribution to the social aspect, not only like to the environment, but, and, you know, and it, it also consolidates their own knowledge. And so it's like, it's like a whole cycle. Thanks, Delta. Um, we're going to move on to our next question. Uh, and Eric is going to speak to, and then we'll all speak to, what is the work of self-construction at each level? Um, and this is, you know, we've had conversations about this, the six panelists, the idea of self-construction. And at every level, at every stage of development, it is a different thing. So Eric, do you want to open that up for, for us sure. with the site students? Yeah. Uh, so this brings back in that term I mentioned earlier, uh, valorization, um, which I, I think can be defined as, in a way, self-construction, as, as being a caring person in the world um, and feeling that you've contributed to that world, to your own development, I suppose. I mean, self-construction is so important. This is beyond Montessori. I, it, it's the fundamental aspect of being alive. If you're not in the process of self-constructing, then you're obviously in some other process, which is probably gonna be harmful to people around you. So at our level, as I was mentioning earlier, there's a bit of a breakdown before there's a reconstruction. And that breakdown is often after they've figured out their identity, in terms of who they are within their family or within their tribe, within their neighborhood, that starts to break down again when the same black and white thinking no longer holds true and they're getting interested in other things. And it can be fractious at our level. If you don't have that social emotional foundation, and this is what all of our curators have found, no learning is happening, not a single bit of it, unless you've got that real supportiveness, um, permission to risk, I call it. And we risk all the time when we take on a new skill, when we're learning something new for the first time. If we don't have that permission to risk, which we can really define as self-confidence, then we're not going anywhere. We're gonna stick our ground, we're gonna put our ear flaps on, we're gonna ignore any new stimulus that might challenge who we think we are. So the work at my level is to literally keep things open, like literally keep the shutters open for another few years so that there's curiosity, there's that sense of, oh, maybe I don't know everything yet. And if you can do that into those first few years of university, then I promise you parents, 
you've just saved $16,000. Because if you don't do that, and you send your child to university and they already shut off of school and their eyes have closed, you've just wasted $16,000 of their first year. And I, I don't think I'm wrong in saying that. It's a bit of an exaggeration, but it's, it's a bit like this. So I'll give it a, a, a tiny example. So one of the students I didn't mention earlier who is my student in my head for my storytelling for this evening is someone that not only started loving the book that we're reading, but decided to ask her parent or both of her parents to form a book club around the same book. <laughs> so from what she told me, there's a bit of a book club going around with our text. And she has been taking the information from school back home and literally having a, a book circle with her, her parents' friends in which she says, no, you don't get it. No, you don't get it. <laughs> no, you don't get it. And there's something so lovely about that because she's self-constructing. This is someone who wasn't that interested in reading. And now there's that small window of, yes, I am again. I am now interested in reading again. And I'm gonna prove it to all of the people in my tribe whose job it is now to understand my new identity that I've just formed. So it's a beautiful thing when there's that sort of understanding, which is so hard for parents, even at that level, to still see their very mature, you know, swearing, absolutely mature, physically child, uh, telling them they're wrong. Um, I think we all know we are wrong. Our generation didn't get it right. And so we have to listen. And so that's a beautiful thing in the self-constructing that I'm with witnessing. It's, it's, it's often an opportunity for us adults to get out of the way and listen. It's wonderful. Um, Allie, I'm gonna throw it back to you and see if you would like to take on that, that idea of, you know, helping and guiding a child as they construct themselves and how we have to get out of the way sometimes for toddlers too. <laughs> so a big part of the self-constructing of a first three years is the really just trying to figure out their emotions is a big their whole day revolves around their emotions really and uh just following them and letting them know that these emotions are okay and that we're gonna get through it and that this is a part of life because as we've said before it starts with us but Eric has said there's some big emotions and so it's Justin in the strata level too. So the big part in our young ones is helping them regulating their emotions and their self-esteem and their self-confidence. So then they are ready to kind of move on to the next level and they're confident in themselves and those skills that they've learned in those first three years. It's almost the foundation of what they're learning for those building blocks for when they're going on to the next levels that they're able to confidently do these things and then they can go and um that's the word i'm going for um better them i'm blanking on the word <laughs> um but that's their big work right now is just constructing because when they were born if you think back they did not know really anything if you think back to when your babies were born. So they are, those first three years are pretty big on constructing their personalities and their emotions and who they will be in the future. So that's big work for us. We throw around these words in, in Montessori, big words called freedom, responsibility, and independence. Um, and these words come around a lot in our, in our parent eds. We talk about them a lot with you as parents and um, you know they mean different things at each age. So Joanna's gonna open up this question of what do they mean? What do they mean for a elementary child, adolescent or for time? Thanks. I'm going to read something that they're not my words, they're better words. 
but I really like this and it's it's a passage I go back to a lot when I'm trying to think about the motivation be, behind work or behind emotions or behind guiding a child's understanding in the upper elementary age an understanding of what is happening around them or an emotional state um, so I could try to think of like well what what are they working on what is the work that's behind what I'm seeing and it is this construction of what they're doing in the confines of they have freedom and responsibility and it, I, it is going to touch on something that Delta will talk about too which is independence but that will be our segue out of freedom and responsibility so here goes I'll give you a little lowdown after of how I see it. The ultimate goal of the elementary class, sorry, is the maturation of an independent person. This person will possess certain characteristics which were built up through his own activities, enterprise and experiences, not from receiving pedantic lectures about desirable virtues. Thank you, those upper L's will not listen. <laughs> This person will have built up his intellect through discussing and debating ideas, by reasoning out dilemmas, by making critical choices, by making decisions based on knowledge. He or she will be able to express his ideas and opinions because he has been free to conduct a forum in which he could practice using his language, formulating his ideas, choosing his words precisely and carefully in order to really communicate to others what was in his mind. He will be a responsible person because he will have had not just one or two, but several ways in which he could come to recognize the importance of each individual, assuming a personal responsibility to the whole. Aligned with this, he will have had opportunities to practice at responsibility and be, until it becomes a natural part of his being. The acquisition of all these essential characteristics has in common one element, freedom a freedom which has been offered to the child in order to make him the allow him to make the development needed for the construction of a useful human being and that is often the work that we are seeing at the at the upper elementary level where they are trying to be as independent as possible and to, to take on as much as they can i had said at the beginning when we we were talking about our six words, I had said flummoxed, and that's, that's when they do become emotional is when they feel suddenly overwhelmed by something that is new or not easily attainable at the beginning. So with responsibility, with freedom comes in turn the recognition that the child has to take responsibility for his own ideas, his own judgments, his own actions, his own decisions. He can only look to himself for the consequences as he alone is responsible. An individual with this capability is now ready and prepared for the extension of freedom that is given at the adolescent plane. So when we look at the child in the classroom and their, their goal to act as a useful person, um, it does draw them into all of the, the intersocial weaving that is happening in the, in the room and with the work that they are doing. Um, it is, it is his own judgments, his own actions, and his own decisions that are being made. And often the, the guiding work that we do is being an intermediary when they run into a bump in the road or in guiding parents to, sit, to see where to let go and allow the child to have their, their freedom um, to have the experience. When we look at responsibility for the child, um, a lot of it, because the classroom is the setup, we're looking at, at them balancing um, work in the classroom with their social drive. And a practical way of how we do that with our, with our upper L's is that we have a lot of meetings. They're short, um, weekly or bi-weekly meetings where we're touching base and saying very, you know, we can go through notebooks, but we can also say, so what have been some successes and what have been some struggles this week? Is there a lesson that you'd like that you may have seen in the classroom? Are you interested in this? Have you tried this since we, we first talked about it? So there's a lot of touching base and guiding um, in that way. And so they are taking a lot of responsibility for their own path and they're quite honest. They get, they get really used to these meetings and they're, they're pretty honest about where their hangups are. <laughs> they're kind of embarrassed, but they're also willing to say it. And, uh, 
and they they're quick to let go of oh well that was that was easier that I did that well but they want to move on they want to they want to keep trying and find find the hard stuff so uh, does anyone else want to speak about freedom and responsibility at their level Delta, do you want to jump in yeah um I'll talk a little bit about how that relates to independence at our level. Um, of, you know, being independent means to not being contingent to something or someone for existence. And the condition of human beings is to strive for independence. So as Kay talked about the natural development and the natural development is to gain successive levels of independence. So we all want to become self-sufficient beings. So, um, you know, my my mother is like an elderly woman and she still, you know, she fights for her independence. She doesn't want to go to a room. She wants to still be alone, even though she can't. So this is a natural development. We all want to do that. So independence is a process. So we, we treat it as a process and we help the process rather than individual. So what kind of independence we talk about are our level? So physical, um, you know, the children would say, help me do it for myself. So it's basically being aware of the physical needs and then respond to them. So becoming responsible. Um, the physical, um, no, the, independ the independence of mind, which says, help me think for myself. So being able to decide for yourself and then accept the consequences of the choices. Um, independence of spirit, which says, help me develop self-esteem, self-confidence and self-regulation. So is being aware of their own accomplishments. So independent, independence is contingent to freedom. So one needs to be able to exercise independence in the environment to be able to develop. So the child will gradually achieve increasing independence when he's trusted to act in his environment and he will begin to have trust in his own abilities. And so, um, you know, so some of the things that we can help is, um, you know, we only give the necessary assistance. Uh, help does not mean do it for me. Um, we obviously, you know, we obviously have to show first. So we don't just say, do this, you can. We, we show them so they can uh, practice. Um, we, do, we do not hold all the, answer to, all the answers to all the questions. And we don't, we also don't, um, you know, we're not the sole judges of approving or disapproving of someone's work. Justin, do you want to jump in with about freedom and responsibility at the adolescent level? There's a lot of, we have a huge school and a, and a huge property and, a, and some of that can be really hard to, to maintain. Um, and we, we have a great staff. It's, a, it's imperative that with that freedom, we're with, we're with them every, every step of the way. Um, in order for them to, in order for them, in order for us to see their, their, their full potential. Um, and they, I think they, with our program, they really have control over their own independence and control over their own, own freedom. And we have these conversations with them at the beginning of the, of the year. And we, we speak with them with maturity and we speak with them as their adults and we, we tell them, this is our program. This is what it has to offer. Here is what, here's this beautiful piece of property and everything that it, that it can offer, but it's up to you guys. We put a little bit of that responsibility on them. We make it real for them. And if they're able to handle more responsibility, we're able to do more amazing things. We're going on a ski trip to, to Blue Mountain, which I tell them every year is only possible because they're, They've shown us that they're able to handle those responsibilities. Um, and I think if you incorporate them into that conversation, rather than just saying this, you're here at Strata, you're following all our rules, this is this is the limits to your freedoms. 
without having that conversation with them, that's, that's when the system starts to, to fail and that's when they start to rebel. And that's when they can start to resent things as well. We found that when we do sit with them and have those conversations, and when we, even when we have to take freedoms away, we still, we always have conversations about that in, in our council meetings or, or one-on-one. And I, I think it, um, it's a really healthy way at, at, at this level um, for them to, to handle that freedom, responsibility and, and independence. Um, so yeah, I hope that makes sense. Thanks, Justin. That really leads really well into our last official question for the evening, which I'm going to throw to Allie. And the last question is probably the most pressing for all of us as parents. Um, and certainly as guides, we spend a lot of time thinking about our role. So what is our role as adults relating to children? And most specifically, how can we as parents support self-construction for our children? And how can we be their support system um, as they grow? So Ali, you want to take that? Yeah, for sure. I'm going to do kind of like a little two-parter uh, type thing. So as we said at, at birth for my young ones, um, when they are born, as I said before, they are kind of just blank slates. And our role is to really model things to them. They don't know how to function all, when they're born. All they know is to eat, sleep, maybe, maybe not sleep, um, and bathroom. That's all they know to do themselves. So we are really helping them just construct them like as a human, they're learning how to move. How do we help them learn that? We can't say, all right, move your right foot and put it in front of your left foot. And now you're left in front of your right. Okay. This is walking. It's us showing them and they're modeling. We're modeling to them how we move or with language, we need to provide that language to them um, because they're absorbing that everything we do, which is super cool, but kind of scary all at the same time. They're taking in absolutely everything that we're doing. Their eyes are always on us. Um, And then back to what kind of Justin, he was just saying with the freedom, a big thing that we can help construct them when they're so young is really providing them with the freedom, but also having really strong limits with them. So they know that they can push up to those boundaries and know what they're capable of. But for us, knowing that we're always going to keep them safe. So they're going to push and see how far as they can go. But knowing that they are strong willed, and that they have the ability to make those choices, to say yes, to say no. And having, starting that at birth, letting them make those decisions, uh, being independent, showing them that they can do things themselves is really kind of what we want when they're 16 or when they're going off to university, that they're gonna be able to say, no, I'm not doing that or, we want them to be confident to be able to make those decisions and that can start when they're 18 months as where does that sound you're prepping them at 18 months for their 18 year old self to really be able to have the confidence and the self-esteem in them to say nope this is what i believe because they've had those choices their whole upbringing kind of thing on um or the strong Um, role models that they have as adults that's showing them that this is a safe place this is what we can do and that they are confident in themselves to do that moving forward which is probably the scariest part but it's our most important part (laughs) thanks Sally in our final bit of the programmed part of the evening, before we open to questions, we have some elevator pitches for you. So I asked the panelists to say within about 30 seconds why your program is awesome and why all people who have the opportunity to attend it should. And Eric is going to start. Being a teenager sucks. So let's make it less sucky and come to a cool school. There you go. I guess I'm, I'm next on, on the level. Teenagers does suck. 
but it doesn't have to suck, I would say. And, and as Kate was saying, why are these programs, what can they offer to all people? And, that, and I think that's where I'll, I'll start with my pitch is that we are not in the business of just pumping out one type of person, which is an, an academic. If we're looking at traditional schools, we are in the business of creating artist, creating master knitters, if anybody can see Donna Mulder on their screens, we are musicians, anything, um, um, shop workers. We need these type of people in the, in the world and, and Strata is the perfect place to, to come, to be whatever you want to be. Thanks, Justin. So <laughs> there's a little connection there with sucking and bad language. If you come to Upper Owl, one of the things we like to do is explore the meaning behind expletives. <laughs> I've heard some conversations as they're so interesting between one and the other. And um, yeah, it's, it's just part of what they're trying to figure out. So. Uh, so that makes it really exciting. It is an exciting age. They are, <clears throat> they are really, really energetic. Most of us who work with upper elementary are very tired by the end of the day, but we also don't watch the clock ever because it's, um, it's just so fast moving the way things evolve. And uh, you're always being, you're always rejiggering your weekly lesson plans because the stuff just happens. Uh, that's so incredible. So the buzz in the room when you've got everyone just exploding with research interests and they're they're building their knowledge of ancient history, but also at the same time formulating their idea of what is their culture that they're living in is just, it's explosive and it carries over into so much of what they do. I had a person who was like, what I said before, flummox, they were so upset about having to do uh MLA um sourcing for some materials and they didn't know what it was they thought it, they thought it was so awful that they had to do this and then by the end of it we're like actually jumping up and down with excitement about citing resources I mean who does that <laughs> but you know who does that 12 year olds they find that kind of thing exciting <laughs> Cracking the code of the upper of the adult world is really exciting for them Jody. Um, thanks, Joe. Uh, I have enjoyed listening to both you and Justin speak. I uh, actually have two children, and both of what you're saying are, is resonating um, so much with me. My son is now in grade nine, um, and my daughter is in her third year in lower L. Um, two very different perspectives, but totally amazing to see. And um, kind of leading off of what Ali said too, is just you, you foster that um, independence and that confidence in, in their toddler years. And that is the one thing that I would say my son has walked away with going through Montessori education for all of these years. He does have that confidence to speak to his teachers and to speak to his peers and to kind of voice his opinion and ask for clarification and all of those great things that you want to see in a young adult. And kind of going off of where Joe left off, um, my daughter in her third year is now off into upper L next year. And she does have that love of learning. It is so, so strong. Um, and you know, loves telling all about her day in different aspects and the lessons that she learns and all of that. They both love learning and they can both investigate. They ask questions instead of waiting to be told what to learn. Um, and I think that is in short in lower L, our aim is to create lifelong independence. Um, and these kids who can adapt to the needs of today and the future. We enable children to be critical thinkers, to be creative, to be strategic thinkers. Um, 
their work becomes developing habits or attitudes necessary to become effective contributors in this world. Built into many culture lessons is a love, of, a love for our natural world. And what I've seen at the end result is a child that develops strong interpersonal skills, kindness, empathy, and accepting, and above all else, a love for our natural world and um, kind of more so just a global citizen. Delta? Hi. I just cut my speech in half, just so you know. <laughs> okay, so why everybody should go back to CASA, everyone, okay? Um, in our CASA environments, the children will be loved, respected, and most of all, trusted. They will have freedom to move and freedom to choose within the limits of their own capabilities. They will learn responsibility by understanding loving, firm, and consistent rules that will help develop their self-regulation, self-discipline, and self-love. All the academic curricula will follow naturally, effortlessly, and joyfully when this child spends three of the six most important years of their life with us. Come to CASA. I'm sold, Delta. I'm coming back and I'm sad that I have to follow that. I didn't prepare a speech. Um, so my pitch for uh, YCC, uh, our main goal is to help. We basically are co-raising the children. We probably spend more time with a lot of the children than a lot of the parents do because they're with us the majority of the day. So our main goal is by the time they leave us that we have helped form these functional, independent, capable, loving, somewhat emotionally stable, they're still working on it, toileted, that's a big one, parents love that, uh, they're able to toilet independently, humans that are confident and just have a love of learning and that that will be fostered in the CASA everything that they will do with us. I remember the word, they will refer, learn those basic functions with us and then it all translates into CASA where it's more for them. But we love them, all their emotions. We accept them all. We hug a lot in our room. We cry a lot in our room and it's the best place to be. <laughs> All right, thank you so much to the panelists. We're going to now open it up to the floor. We have about 10 minutes for questions. So those questions, you know, anything you want to throw at these panelists, they're ready for it. Um, we do ask when you, when you have a question, just unmute and we ask that you start with your six words for your child, if you're willing to share what six words you wrote down. So um, anyone, a question from the floor. You can direct it to a panelist or just broadly and some will speak up. I have a question. Yeah, go for it. Um, yeah. As your as educators, do you, uh, how do you compare the Montessori education versus the public system for preparing our children? for university. If, if, if that is in fact, like I understand not every child's aimed for university, but just let's say if, if that was a, a, a road that is the uh, possibility for, your, uh, for our children, um, how do you compare the two educational streams? Eric, do you wanna to speak to that? Yeah, of course. Um, I think it's really hard because parents tend to come back into the scene after maybe a, you know, a decade out of the scene. They're very involved early on in their child's life. They tend to, you know, kind of let the child do their thing until the child's in grade 11 and 12 again. And it's like, right, I'm back in and now I need to be involved and I need to understand what's going on. But unfortunately, parents, and this is not an insult, you will not understand what's going on because you had high school 
30 years ago, 20 years ago, 40 years ago. And so there's a lot of wrong questions. And one of the wrong questions is, why is your math mark so low? That's the wrong question to ask uh, at parent-teacher meetings. And so if anything, I would say, it's part of that curiosity that a Montessori adolescent experience, certainly at Strata, but also Sight can bring is just keeping that open, curious, you know, lifelong learning mindset going. Because sometimes, I'm a product of public school, you can get great, amazing teachers at public school. So it's not really one versus the other. It's a little bit has to do with numbers. And if you're in a school with 1400 kids and you're anonymous, you can either go more anonymous and just hide, or you can, I don't know, do, go the popularity route and, and deal with all the social issues that have to do with that. But when you have a, a caring group that's smaller, that openness remains, that curiosity for learning remains. And I believe, and I've seen it, that there's then a better opportunity for that child to succeed in university. Well, to me, success means they're not wasting your money in that first year. Because what, I mean, I don't even want to get into what success in university actually means. Is it a degree? Is it your master's? Is it marriage? Is it $100,000 a year? Like what, what is the, the goal here? If you have a curious child and they're skillful and they're still drawn towards learning the guitar or learning to be entrepreneurs, it doesn't matter. You have to keep that flame going. That's what Montessori does. It seems to do it better than most. Justin? Thanks, Eric. I just wanted to, to follow up on your enthusiasm. And I can't, I don't have any stats prepared for how we, we may prepare students for academic life in university. But what I, what I can say is that our students are already questioning, do, do I need to go to university? Who's telling me that I, I need to go to university? Our students are already questioning and understanding what they're really good at. Maybe I don't have to go to university, university in the first place just because society is telling me to go. And I think that, that that's a really important place to, to be at. What we're seeing in the world now is a huge part of our population that's overqualified and under, underemployed. So I think this is, a, this is actually a really big mindset shift that, that should change within society is, is asking yourselves, do we need, if that our main goal, like Eric was saying, to go to university? I think what a, one of the things I can really attest to you is if they were to go to university, if they are to go to college, there are many other parts of university and college life that have to be considered if you're talking about preparing them. It's, do they know how to, how to cook? There's, there's a stat floating out there that one-tenth of, of university students know how to cook for them for themselves if you ever spend a day in the kitchen with mel you pretty much set for life at, at strata um they're learning how to how to make good decisions how to they're, they're confident um they we give them plenty of opportunities to assess their risk at, at, at a young age which when going into university without knowing your own own risk is, is really dangerous so i think we prepare them we prepare those soft skills a lot at, at the adolescent and, and at the adolescent level that, that helps prepare them for that university life as well. And they also have a love of learning and they learn from a, a, a younger age what, what they're really invested in, what they're really interested in. And that's something else that we've seen a lot of, a lot of students going into university just taking a basic BA program or just going into university just for the sake of university and then dropping out of that major within the first year. And as Eric was saying, wasting a ton of money. So I don't want to go on too long. My, my blood pressure is getting up. And this is good. I'm really passionate about the subject. So that's a good question. Kathleen, do you want to speak to that? Kathleen McKinnon, our administrator, has a grade 12 student. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Kathleen. I don't know if um, I know all of you. I, I, I do know most of you from drop off, but um, I'm the elementary administrator and I have also been a multi-story educator for 27 years. I spent the last three years in, in the office, but uh, most of my career has been in the classroom. And I wanted to speak to this um, a little bit maybe because I do have two children, one in grade nine, but my other daughter's in grade 12. 
And uh, so Deb, I can, I can speak to this a little bit more because I am actually living through this at the very, at this very moment as she, you know, uh, applies for university or decides what she's going to do with her life. So I think um, my daughter's, my, my older daughter was in the public system for the first couple of years and they pulled her um, for, for whatever reasons, put her in, in Montessori and, uh, and she spent the majority of her, her years there. And um, I think the biggest thing that I see between her and her peers is um, her ability to advocate for herself to um, she, she spent her elementary years learning how to learn. And I think that is the biggest uh, thing that Montessori offers our, our children is that we're not just um, teaching them, but we're, we are teaching them how to learn um, and how to teach themselves. And so when I've watched her in high school go through, you know, um, having to conform to the, the public Catholic system from where she came from, um, I, I watched her um, kind of raise to the top of her, of her group of um, peers in terms of being able to, you know, um, speak her mind in a very respectful, in a very respectful way, but also um, to not just take it, to kind of, um, she had the confidence um, that Strata and DBMS instilled in her to voice her opinion. And um, as she ends or starts tomorrow, her final uh, semester of high school, which makes me a little bit emotional, I'm not gonna lie. Um, and the world is her oyster now because, and, and, I, and I honestly believe that it's because of the decision my husband and I made to, to give our children a Montessori education. And I think the difference too um, is that Montessori is not just an education, Montessori is a way of life. So um, what, what, you, what you see your children doing in school and what you're doing at home um, really, really prepares them, not just for the academics, but actually for what university um, and high school is all about. And um, I, I cannot say enough about what that's given both my children. Now, Audrey's in grade nine, we still have four years to go, but um, I'm very thankful that um, Audrey or that Claire had the experience at DVMS and at Strata because I, I truly, truly believe that her success is because of, of her Montessori education. So that's it. Thanks, Kathleen. Allie, do you wanna say one last thing? Yeah, I just have one thing to add. Before I was uh, teaching at DVMS, I attended a parent night. Um, I was a nanny of one of the families at the school. And it was when, I think it was when Sight was first becoming. And it was um, a, a, a night led by uh, some of the students and, or we had a past student that was now in university. And one of the main questions from the parents was, why do you feel that you had a better education? And how did it help you in university? And as Kathleen said, and it really stuck in my mind was that she said, I learned how to study and I learned how to learn when I was six and all through elementary and all of my peers in university. She said the first at least semester, they were trying to figure out how they learned because they still didn't know how to learn yet. So they were doing that at 18, 19, trying to figure out how they best learned and how they could succeed instead of actually being excited about school and all this. It was the stress of, I don't even know how to take all of this in. Whereas in Montessori, that starts from lower L. So that was something that really stuck in my mind. And that was a DVMS and Strata student. I'd like to speak to that too, that I think not to use Montessori terms, but just to look at the ways we're teaching, say in an upper L classroom too, is that we are blending some direct instruction that you would think, okay, this is like a kind of a typical lesson. The teacher's talking, the students are taking it in, but it doesn't stop there. The kids are so used to taking that and running with it. It's, it's, we don't say that, they just go and do it. Um, and it's because it's been built up and it's built on the foundation of that sense of independence from CASA that freedom and responsibility, but it is, it is like project-based learning <laughs> that's just 
constantly evolving plus and the teachers are guiding that and 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 working one on one with with students to each one of them is going to work on what what parts of that is difficult for them time management um, chunking a big project down into little smaller compartments but then there is also that that infusion of these direct instructional pieces often with a material so then there's this hand mind connection that's being formed it's just so rich and I can't, I couldn't compare that to, I mean, I'm, Eric had said, well, how can we compare to 30 years ago? But yeah, I mean, it's the preparation that I felt as a, as a person who is in, indeed interested in academics, but definitely there's challenges with doing that when you don't have such a broad way of understanding how you learn or how to even attack something massive. Um, I don't know. I don't, when I look at my children and, and how they're developing in, in lower, upper and, and CASA, I just think they've got so much of those tools are starting to line up for them that it just seems like everything is doable for them. So it's exciting to watch them continue on. Tony has his hand up. Unmute yourself. No, I know we're going over, so, um, but I will, let me just put my hand down because it's okay. So I, I would just say this, I, I posted that in an article that, that Montessori uh, children often turn into happy adults and I think, Deb, your question always sort of raises the hackles of everybody in that I, I don't know if it's the right question. And I think as, as, as we grew up, I went to university, it was something I did, I had to do. And how do our kids do in school? I've actually tracked our kids for the last seven years that have left Strata. And I think uh, with kids without learning challenges, because that's a different challenge. And Deb, if anyone understands that, it's you, um, are all averaging, you know, almost all of them are over 90%, but all of them are above 80 and they're doing really well and they love school. And you'll hear from everybody and you heard it from Kathleen, you heard it from Jody. They're just so good at talking for themselves, advocating for themselves because they've learned to be present in their own education and not disappear into the background and those kind of things. And you listen to the, I, I, I always listen to the language that sort of starts to happen. They learn to, to control their emotions when they're when they're uh, in in CAS, in taught in YCC and toddler and 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 CASA they start to look after others and start to understand that and they lo love working and that work and then they get that creativity that imagination that curiosity about uh, you just talked about projects um, uh, Joanna and then and as they go forward in in um, at, at Strata. They learn all this responsibility and they just, they, they, they're given it. And then they're, they're allowed to organize rallies and they're allowed to reach out and talk to like any professional they want. And they, they're not just sitting there being force fed information. They're filling up their own information. Um, Montessori, when I did my training, they talked about something called entropy. So, so, and syntropy. And so this idea that we, instead of things all falling apart, we build ourselves. We're not in a vessel that we're filling. We're building ourselves in Montessori. And because of that, how do they do in university? Well, if it's the right choice for them, they're actually choosing something that they love and they'll do fantastically well. And if it isn't the right choice for them, they'll find something else that they love to do and they'll do well at that. And so that is really what, what your question is, which is, are they gonna be able to figure out what they love and do it for the rest of their lives? And if they need training in that, then yes, they will. But, but um, so sometimes we get caught up in our own questions as parents and our own worries. And I think we have to trust our children more. And I think that's what Montessori is. On that note, we are going to wrap up the evening. I just have one last, first of all, I would like to thank our panelists and thank our parents. Um, I think one of the, the greatest gifts we are given as guides is your children. Um, I always thank my lucky stars every day that I woke up to do the job I get to do every day. And I know the other guides feel the same way. Uh, we are a part of a new possibility for humanity and we recognize that gift. Uh, Dr. Bonasori said, the child is endowed with unknown powers which can guide us to a radiant future. If what we really want is a new world, then education must take as its aim, the development of these hidden possibilities. Uh, we leave you with that notion that your children are our future, your children are our hope, 
and we work every day to um, realize that possibility. We thank you for tonight and we look forward to future conversations with you. Thank you again and have a wonderful day, everyone. Good night and we'll see you soon. See you tomorrow. Thank you.